much for that welcome. I'm Stan Grant. Now, if you want answers on transgender athletes, racism and religion in sport, we've got the panel for you. Chief Executive of the Australian Sports Commission, Kieran Perkins. Handball player, Hannah Mouncey. Former NRL player and mental health advocate, Joe Williams. Sports lawyer from the University of Canberra, Catherine Ordway. And Pacific Sport consultant, David Lakisa, who works closely with the NRL. Please make them all feel welcome. We have been appalled at the unethical behaviour of many sporting and political leaders, from the Cape Town sandpaper cricket scandal to the Essendon Football Club supplement scandal, and more recently, that sacking that we've just mentioned, in the most undignified and disrespectful way. More recently, we were horrified by Scott Morrison's underhanded secrecy about his multi-ministerial self-appointments. If our leaders can't behave ethically, how can our young people see it modelled? Joe. Thanks for coming to me for this one, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Politics and sport. <laughs> Look, I think, you know, everything... We, we need to show leadership to our young people, you know, and, and we can't... You know, I'm, I'm in the game of, of, of behaviours, right, and, and, and young people model... Mo, young people copy what they see, right? So if, if we're seeing from our, our leaders of the country, if we're seeing from the leaders of, you know, coaching and sporting teams, um, not-so-great behaviour, how on earth... Can we expect change with our young people around these types of issues? You know, we, we looked at some of the, the challenges that were mentioned in the last question. Um, you know, these people, let's, let's, let's call it for what it is, you know, sport, sport for a lot of these people is a job, one, but they are put on a pedestal and, and behaviours are often under the microscope. So we just have to see and have good leadership modelled by people in, in these leadership positions, otherwise our kids and our next generations are just going to follow the same poor behaviours. Is there also a question, David Lakisa, that um, in the case of, of David Warner, there's been some time now since Sandpapergate, that period has been served, if you like. Would you welcome him back into a leadership position as a fan of cricket? Would you want to see that? Nick, that's a great question because it dovetails directly into <laughs> PFAX onto Tim's yeah. question of how many chances, whether it's a second or a third or a fourth opportunity at redemption. But on the back of Joe's comment, uh, Nick, about that unethical behavioural modelling, we live, you know, when we deal with moral, you know, in a, a moral society, we're always going to be let down by one's behaviours and others. Um, and, and, and that's why leadership is so important, but I'm a fan of ensuring leadership starts within the four walls of our own home. You know, it starts with, within, within ourselves, within those we associate with, um, and being involved in coaching at the junior level, mm. uh, there's such an array of experiences from our young people. I remember one team I was coaching, one was dealing with bullying at school, another one was dealing with the parents being separated, another was, was dealing with... Um, uh, you know, with anger issues. And so we've got to be very, very mindful that while we esteem other people in certain roles, albeit leadership, that we've got to be mindful of where we stand as well mm. um, in, in terms of how we want to lead, if that makes sense. Kieran, um, it does come back to this, and you hear this a lot about role modelling. What is the responsibility of an athlete when it comes to, to, to being a good role model? Or is it just to perform? Is it just to go out and play well? Oh, look, I, I, I think personally I, I fall a little bit on Joe's side of that. I, my view is that you are a role model and you have a responsibility. And, and we do hear this in the dialogue a lot. Oh, but, you know, they're just young, they're an athlete, they didn't, you know, they didn't ask for this attention or this, this microscope. Well, what world were you living in where you didn't think that if you became elite and you became an employed member of a um, professional code that there wouldn't be a spotlight on you. Should you be held to a higher account than the Prime Minister, for instance? So, I mean, I know that John Howard said that being Australian <laughs> cricket captain is the second highest honour in, in Australia. But it's been a pretty low bar for a while. <laughs> what, in politics and sport? Or? <laughs> I, I'd, I'd actually put it the other way. I don't think anybody in sport should be held to um, any lesser account than the average person in the country. And, mm. and, and that, that, to me, is where really some of this starts to get a little bit lost along the way, because we do come here tonight and have this conversation as though there is some deification of athletes because they apparently are better, different, mm. I don't know. 
Um, being one, having been one, I probably should know, but I spent most of my athletic career thinking that I'm just a normal human being and if it's good for one person, it's good for me. I, I, I think where we then get into trouble, of course, is because your question about, you know, behaviour from other members of mm. uh, the leadership class in the country, well, um, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's not hold people to account to a poor example that uh, we, we don't agree with it in the get-go. Yeah, and Catherine, then there's a the question of Tim Payne as well, who's now coming back into cricket. And living your life in the glare of publicity, I, I don't... I think probably sports people may even get more scrutiny than politicians. They're always in the public, um, they're always accessible, and the headlines can be just extraordinary when things go wrong. Yeah, it, that's certainly true. But what I was thinking about when you were speaking, Kieran, apart from the, the fish rots from the head expression, which is your point, Joe, about um, leadership having to um, set the tone for the rest of the organisation, what I was kind of concerned about is that there is this double standard between what we see in some of our sports leaders and what the standards are then applied on the athletes. And we have seen a real disconnect between some of our leaders in sport, in both Olympic sport and in professional sport, frankly, that is not reflected in what the expectations are on athletes. And I think that's really not OK. And perhaps that's what we've also seen in the Tim Payne scenario. Yeah, Hannah, of course, you lived through a, a very public story yourself as well. What's it like to be in the glare of, of that publicity and have your life debated by others? Look, it's, it's strange. Uh, it's very surreal. At the time, uh, look, I didn't expect it. And I, I know people will look back and say, how can you not? But I really didn't. And it sort of just happened overnight. So I really didn't probably process it or realise what had happened for three or four years and, until it stopped. Um, but I think, too, it's... I mean, the attention is there. But going back to the, the leadership side of things and it's standing in, starting in the, in the four walls of the home, I actually really think we need to apply that to, you know, sporting organisations in this instance and the pressure and the expectations that are applied that are causing people to perhaps, you know, act out in ways they, they wouldn't otherwise. The ball mm. tampering is a, is a perfect example. And, you know, I said it with James Hurd, I think, you know, we need to embrace failure more and accept that people make mistakes more, be they elite athletes or otherwise. Now, mm. there's some things that, you know, you, you probably wouldn't want to give people a second chance for. I think David Warner absolutely should because he's going to be a much better player in a leadership position now than he would have been before that from what he learnt. And I think we need to step back and realise that, you know, we can put this glare on people, but if they make mistakes as a result of that because of the pressure that's on them, well, perhaps we need to look at the culture that we're creating that, that's causing all of this and... I think we just need to embrace, when it comes to leadership, we need to embrace failure. Failing's great because you learn from it. I love it in moderated doses. <laughs> you know, but it's the best thing you can do because you come out better for it. So I think, you know, we're very quick as a society to, you know, have one person make one mistake and that's it. And I think that's what we need to get Cancel past. Cancel culture. Yeah, absolutely. How do you define inclusivity in sports when players like Israel Folau and the Manly Seven are excluded from playing because they disagree with the homosexual and the rainbow agenda? David. <laughs> well, I'll answer that in 10 seconds flat and then we'll end the show. <laughs> then we... <laughs> I don't think that's it's, how it works. <laughs> it's, it's a delicate dance, right? And it's uh, because it's, uh, it's quite an emotive mm. one uh, for people. And we've got to understand that spirituality in sport is not new. Um, from uh, Eric Liddell in the 1920 uh, Olympics, you know, that, um, as depicted in Chariots of Fire, to Muhammad Ali uh, nearly going to jail because of his Islamic, uh, sorry, uh, his stance on Islamic, uh, Islamic beliefs uh, and, not, and refusing to be inducted into the, mm. the US Army, to even more recently, uh, Hainan Shreka at the AFLW, um, uh, where she sat down with her teammates and, and asked or shared uh, how she felt and they supported her in not wearing the pride jersey. So we've got to be careful that we treat instances as isolated cases but look at the role of, I guess, spiritualities or value, spirituality or value systems. But it's where those values clash. Yeah. That's the point, right? In this case, seven players said, I'm not going to wear it and they didn't play um, but the headlines went on for weeks and there is this clash of... 
whose values matter more? And, and that's where it lies, is allowing that space to people to, for people to value uh, what they prioritise in life. And, uh, and I'm sure those, dis those players made the decision you know, uh, to not cause any hurt or harm, but because they placed their value system and then it clashed in the workplace um, and there was a lack of consultation uh, across all parties, um, whereas, uh, and I'm one to not, it's, we're quick to blame, it was the marketing department, it was the players, it was mm. the, you know, the, those are aiming uh, vitriol online. We've got to be careful here because you just don't know what's in the heart and mind of someone who values, uh, you know, th their value system. And I heard a lot that, oh, it's a, it's a Pacific issue, it's a cultural issue, a religious mm. issue. And for me, I felt it more being a humanistic issue of, well, how are we creating safe spaces for everyone who are involved? But it was a, but it was a religious issue because a lot of the objection was on a religious grounds. Can, can I ask you directly, David, because you've been called in on this and you've been consulting and negotiating around this. Like, if you are one of the players, Pacifica background, religious background, as indeed you come from, would you, what would you have done? Would you have, would you have worn that jumper? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I was thinking of that all day today. It's a, it's a tough question because I'm, uh, I'm Christian, I'm Pacific, and I have friends and family who identify uh, in the LGBT community whom I love dearly. And so, uh, to give you a hard and fast answer, um, I don't know, I would counsel with them first to say, this is how I'm feeling. You know I love you. You know I respect our friendship and compassion. How would you feel if I chose to wear it or not to wear it? And, and to ensure that... That's a very a political answer, David. <laughs> yeah. What, what because... would you do? I'm asking you right now. Here you are. You're one of the manly players. This is what we're doing this weekend. We're wearing the, the pride jumper. Are you going to wear it? Are you going to wear it? I would check with my employer and those whom I love <laughs> in my family and to say... How are you feeling? I, as, but you, but as part not... of my employer, I'm okay to wear it, but not to make a statement, a political statement, but as a showing of love for you, because you're part of my family. I think that was my confusion in, in all of this um, discussion, is why wasn't the starting position love? Why didn't we start and say, what is common here? The Christian faith talks about love. And what we're talking about when we, when we want inclusion for sport is that, that we love and embrace those most marginalised and vulnerable in our community. So, for me, it was an easy one that the starting point is love and inclusion. But there's so, a, I but found that very confusing that there, there was such a discourse in this way. There was a brilliant uh, video that I saw on, on Instagram by a guy called Josh Reed-Jones. And he said, whilst, whilst everybody jumps on what happened and, you know, he didn't agree with the way, the way things went down, and I'm not speaking for him, and, and I didn't agree with the way things went down, but, but what he said was, once we jump on people and completely banish them out of the conversation, the conversation can't be had. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is, is, whilst ever we push people away from the conversation, you'll never see progress within those views. Yeah, but there are questions, aren't there, Hannah, about whose views are heard and whose views matter more. And when you get a clash of, of religion, I and mean, I hear you, Catherine, you say you talk about love, but they also talk about sin. Mm. You talk about sin, Hannah, and, and that is a view that some of the players hold. Yeah, and I think one of the issues for me anyway, and I think a lot of people, was the contradictions in that... Uh, and I, I use the example of, I think it was uh, Will Hopuate, who mm. a few years ago went on a Mormon mission and mm. didn't play on Sundays. Sunday, yeah. And I think for me personally, people were asking this question widely. OK, the Bible also says, you know, don't, you know, don't do anything on Sunday, don't work on Sunday, don't get tattoos, don't do... It. And a lot of these players... You get know, involved with on gambling. Sundays, they're doing all this stuff. Yeah. They're sponsored yeah. by a gambling mm. company. Why was it that... The pride issue was the one that stuck out. You know, they're happy to go against what is said in the Bible. For all those other issues, why this one? And I think it's the contradiction. So, for me, using Will Hopuate as the example, he, you know, wasn't playing on Sundays, you know, went on his Mormon mission for two years. So, I could totally understand if he came out and said, you know what, this is also against my beliefs, because he's been consistent. And you know what, I, everyone's going to disagree, uh, I think. You know, the pride jumper, like with you, Catherine, starts from a place of love, just, just wear it, you know. And, but that's my, my view, and I think, you know, someone like Will Hopuate, I would be very open to going, OK, you know what, 
but you've been consistent. We can see it's not just this issue. I think the problem is people are going, well, why is this the one issue? And why is it whenever the LGBT community is brought into it, is that the issue? And I think that's what people really struggle with. But and that's also... my concern too, is that this is about um, consenting adults in their own home, mm. which doesn't impact anybody else's life. If you think about the comparison, which was really obvious because it was on the jersey, the gambling piece, mm. then that's a massive issue for our community. Mm. Uh, it's... We think it's normal in Australia that gambling is so ingrained in our sport and in our life, but it's not normal across mm. the world. The rest of the world looks at Australia and says, what have you people done? Mm. The horse has bolted in terms of, of sports gambling and gambling in general, and it's a massive issue for us. So why is that OK when that impacts so many people? As an administrator, Kieran, um, if, you know, you, you're, you're running um, uh, the, the Sport Australia. What do you do in a situation like that? Whose rights do you give greater weight to? Why couldn't the players have that view and still be able to play? How would you rule on something like that? Oh, look, it, 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 it is fraught because they are employees and I think that's, that's one of the elements of this conversation which is always a little bit challenging to navigate because we, we throw out the term sport but we don't actually acknowledge that some sports and entertainment industry that employs people to partake in that entertainment mm -hmm. industry and other activities are human beings trying to, for their own and um, their community's benefit, exceed at the highest level um, without reward more broadly. So it's, it, that's a hard part. And because of that, I probably start a little bit more on the um, employee relations side of the, the argument, which is if, if you are employed to wear a uniform and that uniform requires certain things, then you've got to have an open conversation. Does, does, that, it's, mean, it's, does it's, that mean, so you, you can't play, you can't compete, you can't swim? Uh, I, I think it can get to that point, but... Well, it did you, get you, to that point, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they didn't play. The, the, the gap for me in, in, in the conversation and the way that that went down, it, it, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of open dialogue and consultation beforehand because we can't have it both ways. We can't say on the one hand um, a certain segment of society's viewpoint is more important than another's and not then actually take into account um, the, the, the social or um, moral hazard that comes with refusing to acknowledge another person's perspective. Mm. But... I, I personally, when it really does get down to it, I fall on the side of humanity and I think that the minute that you start trying to pick and choose which part of the human race you're willing to accept and embrace, then um, you're probably not going to be uh, the right person to be employed in, in a leadership role like that. So because of your faith and a faith-based objection to something, you can't, you can't play you would make that decision? Only in the context that if you refuse to in, in, engage and embrace in what the organisation was trying to um, deliver. There's another aspect to this, David, and I wonder if you can clear this up for us, because we hear a lot about the religious aspect, and I also heard a lot about the cultural aspect. How do you work around that? Um, there is a concept of VAR, as I understand, which is a respectful concept. There is also... Um, the, the Pacifica queer community, mm. the Fafafini uh, as well. Uh, can you explain how that plays into this? Because that also seemed to go to a, a bit of a contradiction or it becomes more complex. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And for those who aren't aware, the Pacific diaspora is a, a youthful and emerging population in Australia. It's important that we contextualise uh, this and quite often, uh, very similar to the episode before, there's a stigmatisation of, say, Chinese Australians. It's the same with many cultural groups. There is a stigma attached to being a Pacific Islander in Australia. And I say it respectfully, often it's, oh, you're a footballer, an unskilled worker and a, and a, and a labourer. And because we're heavily, un while it's only 1.5% of the population make up 50% of professional rugby league and rugby union codes. Mm. Now, that's a huge disparity. Now, one could argue that's actually an overrepresentation based on the. Mm. Um, but when it comes to executives, technical yeah. coaching administration, they're heavily underrepresented. Um, hence why, as a former employee of the league, uh, I went down the academic route to, yeah. to unpack. So that, that's it contextually. But we also need to understand that being Pacific is ethnically diverse. 1,500 different languages, 25 different nations, and it's so easy to blanket cover being Pacific. Mm. Yeah. And Hannah and I just had a really awesome conversation about... <laughs> um, 
Pacific culture, and queerness is not nothing new in Pacific culture. You, you mentioned uh, the fafa fine, uh, which translate it's the Samoan word for to be like a lady, or a fatama to be like a man. They are accepted in Pacific or well, in Samoan culture, more so in Polynesian, mm -hmm. less so in Melanesian mm -hmm. uh, countries such as Papua New Guinea, where, where you know where there's a lot of gender inequality. Uh, uh, and, and, and empowerment and the Solomon Islands. So we've got to contextualise that. Um, that said, um, in the Samoan culture, uh, anyway, the Fafa Fine is, is accepted, is celebrated, is, plays a valuable part in society. And, and yet some of these players were saying, I'm not going to wear this jumper. So how do we, how do we square that circle, if you like, if there is a religious objection, but there's also a cultural aspect? Yeah. I don't know if it needs sort of squaring mm. in terms of right or wrong, yes or no, I think it's important to understand that people in, with spirituality have varying degrees of beliefs or practicing levels, and we, we've got to be careful that we're not blanketing that all Christians practice a certain, certain way, especially when recent census data shows that uh, uh, 60 years ago, 90% of our population identified as Christian, as last year, it said, I think we're only around 43%. Mm and a 39% identified as no religion. Mm. And so there's this juncture occurring in our Australian society in terms of spirituality, if you will, and how that plays out. But in terms of Pacific, um, in terms of Pacific culture, uh, those varying degrees of practice mm. and belief plays out differently for different communities and different athletes, different families. So we've just got to be careful. And as a Pacific Christian, myself. I, I don't speak for all Pacific mm. people. I don't speak for all Christians. And even though I hold a PhD, it's a license for me to say, I want to learn more. I'm mm. keen to learn more. I want to, I want to respect more. Well, I want to embrace more. And so that's a, it's a delicate, delicate um, experience. I don't like sports culture at all. Um, I've seen and heard things, sexist and racist comments, behaviours that have really shredded me emotionally. And I'm only a bystander. So I just can't imagine what that means for players. So I, I guess I wanted to direct this to Joe. Um, for the players, do you think players that are subjected to these traumatic racist slurs from bystanders in the name of a good day out at the game, do you think they're still expected to just shrug off this sort of racism? Is, are things changing? I get asked this question all the time. Does does the NRL have a problem with racism? Does the AFL have a problem with racism? I believe Australia has a problem with racism. Yep. You know, sport is a byproduct of, of a larger country, right? Let's look at what racism does. Are, are, players, are players expected to just shrug it off? Let's look at the actual, the, the impact and effects of what racism is. And, and, and in, in alerting our stress response in our brain and, and everything that happens during that process of being targeted, racially vilified, takes us directly back to years and decades of our, of our you know, our, our, our mothers and fathers and, and grandparents being flogged and raped and bashed, you know, just for being coloured. You know, so that impact is a direct uh, relationship or takes us back directly to those, to those times. How do you deal with it, Joe, when it happens on the field to you? I'm lucky that that to me and for me is that I've got a... I, I, w I would like to class myself as someone who's, uh, what's, what's the term they say, uh, emotionally intelligent around that sort of stuff. I know if I go and knock someone's teeth out, who gets in trouble? Um, everything, inside me, everything inside me wants to do that, but I'm lucky that I've got a fast process within my mind that I can pull myself away from that. And, 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 and something that my father once said to me, uh, he said, you'll never, beat, you'll never beat racism with your fist, Joe because of, and this was on the back of, you know, some, some violent episodes by me as a, as a youngster being called X, Y, Z. Um, he said, you'll never ever beat racism with your fist. You'll only ever beat racism with intelligence and the truth. And what I've come to see in my, I don't like to say it on national television, almost 39 years of life, <laughs> is so that racists aren't, <laughs> <laughs> racists aren't overly intelligent. So when you start to hit them with the truth and the facts, you actually expose their lack of intelligence and you actually expose just how, how, how insignificant they are. And, and I have to say, Stan... Uh, I, I, 
think it's also worth mentioning, Stan, and it comes back to also the leadership question that we posed right at the very start of this, because Joe's right, sport, sport is a symptom of society, it is not the maker of society. However, we do have a leadership position to take and I think more, more parts of the sporting system actually need to be a lot more vocal and o open about the behaviours they will where's and that, won't accept and, and deal with it. Where's that failing, Catherine? Because it persists. The Eddie Betts um, book recently revealed what he went through. Um, we've seen Collingwood go through this several times. Um, we heard the Adam Goods affair. Uh, you talk a lot, June, about community sport and understand you've seen it at community sport level. So why? Where is the failure here? Yeah, you're 100% correct. Community sport is rife with both um, racism directed at um, players and referees, coaches, everyone, but the intersectionality of that against women is so disproportionate. It's out of control, actually, in, in community sport, and it's a real concern. Um, I wondered whether you and David and Joe had any idea about, uh, any thoughts about what it is about sport that seems to give people a licence to behave in a way that you won't see them behaving when they're at the supermarket or in the street or, or whatever. There some, seems to be something that you allows people to, you to do it. it. We in see it, it every day. Mm. In the looks that we get, the microaggressions, the looks that we get, the way that we're treated, the, 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 the person in the car or the, the person at the counter serving the white person before they serve the coloured person. We see it every day. It isn't, this isn't a sport issue. This is an Australia issue. The thing is, people don't realise what this country in 1788 was birthed on. It was birthed on racism. And, and the fact that we live it now in everything that we do and everywhere that we're exposed to is that we are remnants. No, any wonder that we're dying 10 years younger than, than, than non-Indigenous Australians is because of the impact of stress that it's having on our people, that it's having on our direct health outcomes. Mm. When we're going to talk about closing the gap, we're going to talk about race in closing the gap as well and the challenges that we have with race in this country. We're Hi. Um, currently, there's still some clubs and community sporting groups from grassroots through to professional competitions that are still continuing to exclude unvaccinated people, even though the mandates have dropped. Why are we not talking about the prejudice and the stigma that is currently surrounding these people who've just survived 10, 11 months of being physically excluded and discriminated, like in a way that we have not seen in Australia for a long, long time or if ever before? How do we encourage this minority group back into sport and what does the future look like for the unvaccinated community? A question from the lockdown capital um, <laughs> of Australia, if not the world. Catherine. It's a really difficult one and I think from a professional sport perspective they've really grappled with this. So this is a really great question from the community level because I, I agree with you. People are not thinking about it and they're not talking about it and in the same way that we started out by saying that the most marginalised vulnerable people in the community need love and to be embraced by sport then that is exactly the conversation we need to be having at the community level. At the professional level of course as Kieran mentioned this is an employment contract situation and you can set what the rules are are in an employment relationship, but in community sport, we should be saying, everyone, let's play. What do you do at a professional level, Kieran? Oh, look, I, I, we, we actually struggled with this just recently at the Commonwealth Games because obviously the, the Australian team took a very extreme view and was, was managing COVID and infection uh, at, at its extreme end. Uh, I'm not sure that there was a mandate, though. I, I, I'd have to check on that. Um, whereas the rest of the world absolutely did not in any way acknowledge, care or even um, bother with uh, dealing with COVID. So I think we need to move forward in a high performance environment where you have one opportunity to compete at one time. We want to give the best protection we can to ensure that everybody doesn't lose that opportunity. But at a community level, I, I, I can't see that there is any reason for this to be a problem. What are we going to do with Novak, Novak Djokovic? Um, <laughs> should, he be back, should he be let back in for the, uh, the Australian Open? What do you think? Let him back in. Let him back in? Hands up. Hands up. Let him back in. Keep Novak Djokovic out. Oh, the outs win. Sorry, Novak. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we've got time for. Thanks again to our panel, Kieran Perkins, Hannah Mouncey, Joe Williams, Catherine Ordway and David Lakisa. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, for
for joining us here, um, for bringing your questions and, and getting involved in the conversation and driving that conversation. Thanks to you at home as well. Next week, we're live in Sydney and joining me to answer your questions, British philosopher and writer AC Grayling, Finance Minister Katie Gallagher, Shadow Assistant Treasurer Stuart Robert and Agribusiness Leader Catherine Marriott. Do head to our website. You can register to be in the audience. And you can catch me on China Tonight on Monday at 9.35. Good night. Thank you.